Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Derek Chauvin behind bars today. The ex-cop facing up to 75 years in prison found guilty of all charges in George Floyd's death. And this could be just the beginning for the Minneapolis Police Department. The Department of Justice launching an investigation into its patterns and practices. We undertake this task with determination and urgency, knowing that change cannot wait. In Columbus, Ohio, a new body cam video of the moments before police shot and killed a 16-year-old black girl, what they're saying about her death. And we start the show today with NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez. He is in Minneapolis for us today. Uh, Gabe, people started celebrating there across the city as soon as they heard the guilty verdict. Uh, George Floyd's cousin Tara Brown telling MSNBC's Craig Melvin today that the people in the streets, the protesters all year long, helped make this verdict possible. Here she is. I've even had people to say to me um, since this all started that there were times before this that they did not get it. And so being exposed to the protest and um, it, it just, you know, it was one of those things that just kind of pushed this movement forward. Um, you couldn't help but see it. Gabe, tell us, if you will, what it's been like in Minneapolis today. Uh, what kind of reaction, what kind of vibe are you getting from the people you've spoken with today? Yeah, hi there, Allison. Well, re relief has certainly given way to reflection here in Minneapolis. This was a verdict that had been awaited here for not just weeks, but months, really the better part of a year. This is a community that had been on edge for just as long as anyone could remember here. We spoke with the mayor this morning. He called this one of the most significant moments in the city's history. And as you mentioned, Floyd's family is also reacting, now calling for police reform at the federal level, of course, uh, at the uh, the uh, Federal Police Reform Act has been passed by the U.S. House, not the U.S. Senate. Now there are a lot of calls here uh, to move that forward. But, Allison, there's also uh, a lot of questions about what's next for not just the future of police reform, but the future of, um, you know, this uh, this case. Three other officers that are involved, they'll go, uh, they'll, uh, they'll uh, have a trial together uh, in August. Uh, Derek Chauvin himself, as you, you mentioned, he is now in jail in a maximum security prison in segregation for his own safety as he faces charges, uh, or, you know, sentencing, as he awaits sentencing in about two months uh, for that uh, second-degree murder uh, conviction, as well as third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter, up to 40 years in prison, potentially, uh, for that uh, first charge, for the second charge, up to 25 and up to 10 years in prison for the manslaughter charge. But again, this is a community that had been waiting uh, for this verdict for quite some time. It was a very emotional, uh, this uh, yeah. wave of relief that swept over this crowd here, uh, but now giving way to a lot of reflection about what's next, Allison. Yeah, what's next? The big question today. Gabe Gutierrez in Minneapolis, thank you so much. How are cities across the country reacting to the Chauvin verdict today? NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett is at a rally for police reform in Chicago. Allison, the collective sigh of relief was exemplified by a night of calm and peace here in Chicago, even as the city was preparing for unrest like we saw here last summer. But that very much wasn't the case, though. The feelings were coupled with feelings of anxiety and doubt about police reform going forward this morning here at City Hall, a rally for police accountability already happening the morning after we got that Chauvin verdict. And I spoke with some people here about the overall reactions about what this means moving forward, because remember, here in Chicago, they're still grappling with the shooting and killing of 13-year-old Adam Toledo by a Chicago police officer, a longstanding history of tension uh, with the Chicago police. And so people here are still frustrated, but looking to do the work. Take a listen to some of our conversations. Maybe the officers will think twice before they ask, open fire. You know, it's a lot about the guns. It's, it's the guns. It's the opening fire. You can't just open fire on everyone, you know, especially if they have no weapons. You can't just do that. You can't hurt people out here just because you're an officer. Seeing what happened to Adam Toledo is, is a natural consequence of how the policing system is built to operate. They need to start listening to us and making these decisions because um, we're not going away. Now, remember, Chicago saw justice for Laquan McDonald back in 
2018 when that police officer was convicted of second degree murder. But even since then, this community has seen dozens of killings by uh, police officers, uh, Adam Toledo being the most recent one. And that investigation is still ongoing. We saw the body cam video released just last week. I covered vigils over the weekend as people in the community are still really frustrated by the lack of a police accountability. This rally here advocating for community policing in the area. And this is also coupled with the fact that the mayor here in Chicago is meeting a lot of frustration as well. She ran on plans of police reform, but having been in office for nearly two years now, hasn't put anything forward that the community is satisfied with. So coupled with the Chauvin verdict, as well as everything going on here as they're looking to hold police accountable, the pressure is really on against the Chicago PD. Allison. Yesterday's verdict in the state criminal trial does not address potentially systemic policing issues in Minneapolis. Today, I am announcing that the Justice Department has opened a civil investigation to determine whether the Minneapolis Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of unconstitutional or unlawful policing. Attorney General Merrick Garland there announcing a DOJ investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. NBC News Justice Correspondent Pete Williams joining me now. Uh, Pete, the Justice Department calling this a pattern or practice investigation. Can you explain what that means for our viewers? Sure. That's a term in federal law that gives the government the power to do these investigations. And what they'll be looking at here is, does the police department in Minneapolis use excessive force, especially against protesters? Does it engage in discriminatory conduct? with the people it comes into contact with. How does it treat people who have uh, behavioral health problems? How are police officers trained? How are they supervised? And what kind of accountability does the department have for enforcing those rules when police get out of line? Those are some of the things that they'll be looking at here. These investigations typically take about a year, and the police department says that it welcomes the investigation. The police chief there says he wants to make changes, and he thinks that this investigation will help. Uh, Pete, George Floyd's cousin Tara Brown telling MSNBC's Craig Melvin that she hopes this is the start of police reform. Here she is earlier today. I think it's a good thing. It's always a good thing to have quality checks and um, there's always room for improvement. And I think it's a good thing that this is a good way to start um, making sure that uh, the policies are what they should be and that, you know, this kind of behavior is not tolerated. Hopefully it'll catch on. Other departments will do the same thing. Pete, what kind of reform could potentially come from an investigation like this, and can it extend beyond Minneapolis? Well, this investigation will be aimed specifically at and solely at Minneapolis, and it will produce a public report, and it will make recommendations. If the police department chooses to follow them, that's good, and sometimes the government and the police department will go to court and get what's called a consent decree, uh, consent decree telling the court, hey, here's what we agree to. But if the department doesn't want to do some things, and this has happened in other cases, then the government can go to court and sue them and get a court order requiring to make these changes. And sometimes in these investigations, what will happen is there'll be an, the uh, court will appoint an independent monitor to make sure the government, uh, that the police department is following what it says it was supposed to do and what the court ordered it to do, make these reforms. But they have led to reforms and changes in police departments across the country, both large and small in the years and decades that the department's been doing this. Pete, last Friday, uh, I understand Attorney General Garland rescinded a Trump-era policy that curbed these types of investigations. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, these all started in 1994. That's when uh, Congress gave the Justice Department the authority to conduct these investigations. It was in the wake of the widespread protests over the televised beating of Rodney King and uh, the government's been doing these investigations, but then during the Trump administration, Jeff Sessions, who was then the attorney general, had a very dim view of these. He used to go around to police groups saying, I have your back, don't worry. Uh, he thought these investigations were counterproductive. And Attorney General Barr, uh, despite the recommendation of some people in the Justice Department that they open one of these investigations in the Minneapolis Police Department, thought it wasn't the right time, that it would be counterproductive, that it wouldn't do any good. And Sessions actually wrote a memo making it much, much harder to open the investigations, pretty much turning the spigot off. It was last Friday that Merrick Garland rescinded that memo. So it reverts now. We're back to the way it's normally been done. 
About 40 of these uh, agreements have been reached with police departments since mm -hmm. this started, uh, and about 100 or so investigations. All right, and here we are today with the DOJ uh, launching a civil investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. Pete, thanks so much. You bet. All right, let's bring in Yodit Tewelde, a former criminal defense lawyer, former prosecutor, and host of Making the Case on the Black News Channel, and C.K. Hoffler, president of the National Bar Association. Ladies, wonderful to have you both here today. Thank you so much. Uh, C.K., I'd love to start with you and the DOJ's new civil rights investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, here's the attorney general today. Broad participation in this investigation from the community and from law enforcement will be vital to its success. The Justice Department has already begun to reach out to community groups and members of the public to learn about their experiences with the MPD. CK, how does an investigation like this work and what kind of community and police participation are we talking about here? Well, first of all, this investigation is a great step towards the overhaul, complete overhaul of our policing system, ultimately in the United States. But let's start with Minneapolis. How does it work? Well, the Justice mm -hmm. Department has the ability to actually investigate police departments, especially based on the information and evidence they have. So they would begin an investigation, hopefully with the cooperation of the police department, and come up with some findings. Those findings could ultimately lead to a consent decree of some form or fashion, or it could lead to litigation. It just depends on how cooperative um, the, the authorities in Minneapolis are going to be and the findings. And that's the beginning. That's one way that you can bring out in one locality, in one state, policing reform desperately needed. And it comes on the heels of the verdict of the George Floyd, um, of the, not George Floyd, but George Floyd's verdict, the verdict in the George Floyd murder case, um, Derek Chauvin's case. And so it's very, very important that this investigation is going to take place now and that the attorney general is jumping on this now. I dare say that this is just the beginning, that this attorney general is going to be very proactive and is going to also have other investigations. Just think in the past 24 hours, we've had two more killings. We just had a killing in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Robert Brown, 40 years old, 10 children. And then we had a 16-year-old in Columbus, Ohio, who also has been killed at the hands of the police. It's very soon, it's too soon possibly to, to see and to, to, to figure out what happened exactly, although I will applaud the police in Columbus, Ohio, for releasing the video so quickly. That's probably as a result of the verdict in the Derek Chauvin case. But there's so much work to be done so that the U.S. Department of Justice is already jumping in and Merrick Garland is saying, we are on this and we are going to conduct an investigation because we believe there needs to be change and we need to see what's happening here is a great step because certainly that could be a model for the same thing to happen in other places. And then we've got to push on the congressional front. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act must be passed. It must be passed. All right. So, Yodi, let's look back at the trial here. Derek Chauvin didn't testify. He didn't show any emotion. I mean, he was barely blinking when he was found guilty on all counts. Uh, a former police officer turned professor told NBCNews.com that the jury needed to hear something from this man to allow the defense at best to go to a hung jury. The silence was just as cold and callous as it was when Chauvin was silent and cold on the neck of George Floyd. Uh, you did, how could Derek Chauvin have, have maybe helped himself in this trial? Is there anything that you think he could have done here? Uh, and is there anything that he, he needs to do to garner any sort of sympathy uh, at, at his sentencing? Or, or, or is he just beyond that point? Well, first, the defendant has the right to not take the stand, and the jurors understood that in jury selection, that this was a right uh, for the defendant not to take the stand. And there's various reasons why, not just because of guilt per se, but there could be a number of things that could go wrong on the stand. And the jury would perceive that to sure. be something that we can't necessarily help. But what the defense attorney was doing with Derek Chauvin was instructing him basically to keep writing in that notepad. People were wondering, what was Derek Chauvin writing? so feverishly throughout the entire trial on this notepad well, in order for him to not make any facial expressions, to react to any type of testimony brought on by the state. Because again, jurors are very perceptive. They can pick up on those type of things. So that was one thing. Two, 
Imagine the, the prosecution's glee to have Derek Chauvin on that stand. I was a former prosecutor. Whenever you got a, defense, a defendant on the stand, we were salivating because now this was our turn to question yeah. the man of the hour. And imagine what that prosecutor would have done. Taking that nine minute and 29 second video, took it frame by frame and asked Derek Chauvin, on as many occasions as possible, why he never let up on George Floyd's neck. It would have been a disaster. So, yes, some people would have said, hey, I want to hear from the defendant. Most jurors do. But it would have been a complete and utter disaster on cross-examination, just like it was a disaster when the prosecutors were cross-examining the witnesses for the defense. And that was the defense attorney's way of speaking for Derek Chauvin, was through their experts and through the line of questioning in order for him not to be able to take that stand. So... It was a good idea. I was always wondering how this trial could actually, the defense case could actually go worse or get worse. It would have been worse if Derek Chauvin took the stand. Let me ask you one quick question before we go. Will that change in sentencing? Will he need to say something? Will he need to express some sort of remorse there? Or as a defense attorney, would you advise him just to, to keep the course and not say anything? Well, I would be, is that a question for me? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would be, as a defense attorney, I would be presenting mitigating evidence for the, for my client. Um, and I would be trying to refute the aggravating factors that the prosecution is trying to establish. And they're trying to go for an aggravated sentence, meaning beyond what the state guidelines are. Right. So he's got no, no history, criminal history. The prosecutor, the guidelines would be about 12 years for the top murder charge. Well, the prosecution is saying, no, we want to establish aggravating factors in this case that would go beyond that. And so as a defense attorney, I'd be focused on that. I wouldn't be so, so gun ho on, on letting Chauvin talk because I mean, again, you just never know what he's going to say. You don't want to prepare him for something like that either. So I would be trying to refute those factors and try to present the fact that he has no criminal history and try to get as much mitigating evidence as possible in order for the judge to lessen the sentence. All right, we have to leave it there. CK Yodi, thank you both so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's check in with NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She has the latest headlines for us from NBCnews.com. How you doing, Simone? Hey, Allison. Today we start in Bali, where Indonesia's Navy is searching for a submarine that went missing this morning. Authorities say the underwater craft had 53 people on board, and now the Navy is asking Australia and Singapore to help out with the search. Well, Subaru is recalling nearly 875,000 vehicles in the U.S. The company saying that the recall is due to engines stalling in some models and suspension problems in others. Now, this recall will begin on May 28th. And the poverty rate in the U.S. reaching its pandemic peak last month at 11.7 percent, even as the unemployment rate fell and states loosened business restrictions. The new numbers coming from census data research from the University of Chicago and Notre Dame. The report also finding black poverty rates even higher at 21 percent. Well, in Los Angeles, a federal judge overseeing a sweeping lawsuit about local homelessness ordered the city and county to find shelters for all unhoused residents living on L.A.'s infamous Skid Row within 180 days. Judge David O. Carter in his order saying, quote, all of the rhetoric, promises, plans and budgeting cannot obscure the shameful reality of this crisis that year after year, more homeless Angelinos die on the streets. Well, plans for a breakaway European Soccer Super League are now called off. Multiple soccer clubs involved are pulling out of the plan after widespread criticism. Plus, one of the league's founders today saying he doesn't think the project is still up and running. Allison, that'll do it for me for now. I will see you in a little bit. All right, Simone, thanks so much. Protesters in the streets of Columbus, Ohio, overnight chanting Makai Bryant, the name of a 16-year-old black girl police shot and killed yesterday afternoon when they were responding to a 911 call about an attempted stabbing. Just a warning for you, this next video is disturbing. This is newly released body cam footage of the incident. It looks like Bryant in the video is trying to stab two girls just before police shot her. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman is in Columbus, Ohio for us now. Josh, this shooting happened right before the Derek Chauvin verdict was announced. What do you know today uh, about the victim and what happened there? 
Well, Allison, you mentioned that it looks in that video like Michaela Bryant is trying to stab someone with a knife uh, in the moments before she was fatally shot. Police are saying that that is what they believe was taking place just before the officer sh shot her, what appears to be four times. Police today, just in the last couple of hours, are releasing 911 tapes that show there was a 911 call uh, in which you can hear an altercation in the background. There was clearly some type of disturbance going on as a female caller reported to police that someone was trying to uh, stab them. We don't know uh, exactly who that caller uh, was, uh, but police were able to show up uh, about eight minutes later. Uh, that is when police say uh, that this shooting uh, had took place after the officer saw, uh, saw her with that knife. Uh, but still a lot of unanswered questions uh, about exactly what happened here with police generally deferring to the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, uh, a state authority, to do an independent probe, figure out whether the laws and policies were abided to here. Josh, a couple of questions for you. First of all, uh, what are Columbus police saying uh, about this shooting? They are saying that this was a tragedy any way you look at it. They know tensions are running mm -hmm. extremely high in our country right now, particularly after the Chauvin verdict. Uh, they know how this uh, kind of tape looks and the kind of fear that it creates uh, for people. But they are urging people to be patient, saying that while uh, you, you can see what happened on the video, that there are so many other questions that need to be answered, such as what would have happened had the officer not pulled the trigger at that moment? Could the other girl uh, in that video who appears uh, to have been fighting uh, in that moment uh, with Michaela Bryant, could she have been injured? And those are some of the questions they say need to be answered before anyone can jump to conclusions. So, Josh, another unusual thing, we just don't typically see body cam footage this quickly. Uh, why did the department release this video right away? What are they saying about that? Well, they are saying that they wanted to release everything they possibly could in the interest of transparency, in the interest uh, of giving people uh, at least some sense uh, of what happened here, because uh, the, uh, the investigation to actually figure out uh, were any laws broken, should anybody be charged, that could take a long time. And they know that people uh, n need to be able to have some way to reckon uh, with this. And so they're trying to uh, build trust uh, by having that transparency. The mayor telling me just a few minutes ago, uh, that he wants the community to continue to press the police to be better, to be more accountable, to do a better job in their recruiting. Uh, they hope that this will be a first step to showing uh, that they intend to build and improve that trust with the community. All right, Josh Letterman in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. Democrats on Capitol Hill saying that the Chauvin verdict is not a substitute for police reform. They are turning up the pressure on Senate Republicans to pass the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joining me now. Leanne, Congresswoman Karen Bass, who sponsored this bill, says it has more momentum now. Uh, here's what she told Rachel Maddow last night. I have been watching this and have been involved in this issue for decades, and it's terrible that it took the world witnessing the torture and murder of an individual to bring about this type of change. But I do feel like we're on the cusp of doing that. So I am hopeful today. I don't know what I would have done if the verdict had turned out wrong, but it didn't. And so I am hoping that the measure of hope that we all got today will be enough to get us over the finish line and put a bill on President Biden's desk. So, Leah, what is the latest on that bill today? Hey, Allison. So the House passed the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing bill last month. It's been stalled in the Senate because it does not have the support of 10 Republicans necessary to reach that 60 vote threshold. Although there have been bipartisan discussions led by Representative Bass on the Democratic side, Senator Cory Booker, also a Democrat of New Jersey, and the Republican Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. Those discussions had been pretty slow moving, but you heard Bass's comments. And then I also caught up with Senator Scott earlier today, and he also expressed uh, more optimism than I've heard in a very long time, saying that he thinks that perhaps there could be some sort of bipartisan agreement within the next couple of weeks, Allison. 
Leanne, just remind our viewers, what is in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and, and what are the biggest sticking points in this act when it comes uh, to the Senate Republicans? Yeah, let's start with what's in the bill and then we'll talk about the differences. Mm -hmm. So what's in the bill, this bill bans no knock uh, warrants. It bans uh, chokeholds. Um, it creates a national, nationwide police misconduct database. And then it reforms this issue of qualified immunity. And that is this issue that is perhaps the most complicated. And what it does is the qualified immu immunity in its current form uh, prevents police officers from being held held liable or responsible for wrongdoing while on the job. And Repo Democrats want to completely reform that and make sure that police officers are held accountable. Republicans say that's going to drive out a lot of police officers in, in indirectly mm -hmm. defund the police because they won't be able to recruit and maintain police officers. Well, Senator Scott said he, his new proposal, what he offered to Democrats, is in Instead of holding the police officer, the employee, accountable, then perhaps they should hold the police department, the employer, accountable. And that could be some sort of compromise. We haven't heard back from Democrats, though, on if that's something that they are willing to, uh, to support. But again, this issue of qualified immunity, uh, police officer individual accountability is a major sticking point. It was a sticking point last year, and it continues to be one this year, Allison. Leanne, also today, the Senate confirmed Vanita Gupta for associate attorney general. Today, it's the number three spot over at the DOJ. What can you tell us about her and how that vote went? Yeah, well, Vice President Kamala Harris came to the Hill expecting to have to be a tiebreaker vote because there was no indication that any Republican was going to support her. But Alaska Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski did come out and support her, and she explains her vote on the Senate floor. Let's take a listen. I felt that I was speaking to a woman who had not only committed a professional life to try to get to the base of, of these, these injustices, to try to not just direct a little bit of money, put a program in place and walk away and call it a day, uh, but to truly try to make a difference. Senator Murkowski bucked her party. Most Republicans said that they opposed her because she was critical of Republicans during the Trump administration. Others uh, claimed that she had supported in the past defunding the police, something that Gupta had denied. But it's also important to note, Allison, that the mostly united Republican opposition was mostly here in Congress. There was a lot of Republicans outside of Congress who came out in support of, of her including the former DHS secretary under President Bush, the Fraternal Order of Police, and a long list of Republicans who say that she is a consensus builder and highly qualified for the job, Allison. All right, Leanne Caldwell on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Arizona's governor sending the National Guard to the state's southwest border, declaring a state of emergency and blaming the Biden administration for the surge of illegal border crossings. Let me tell you, it's just as bad, if not worse, than the coverage we've been seeing. The U.S. Border Patrol is overwhelmed. Local law enforcement and mayors are calling out for help. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns has been reporting from Arizona's border. She joins us live now. Dasha, Arizona, the first state to declare a border control state of emergency. Uh, I know you rode along with the uh, Cochise County Sheriff. Correct me if I'm saying that county wrong. Uh, but what did you see and how is the National Guard uh, going to help law enforcement there? Hey, Allison. Yeah, you got it right. Cochise County, it shares 83 miles of border with Mexico, and it's in the Tucson sector, which is the second busiest for Border Patrol apprehension, second only to the Rio Grande Valley. And as we drove along the wall there, we can literally see traces of people who have recently come across. There are multiple places where uh, barbed wire in the wall has been cut, where you can see uh, backpacks, clothing, shoes, ropes from people who climbed over the wall. And in just the couple of hours that we spent with the sheriff's deputy out there, we saw two uh, young men apprehended.
apprehended. They were from Mexico. Uh, they were apprehended by Border Patrol, and, and they told us that they were coming to the U.S. to look for work to provide for their families. And Allison, the numbers here, they are going up. Uh, they've nearly doubled since January. And the sheriff tells us that although the numbers are increasing, the resources from Border Patrol here are declining. Take a listen to just some of what he told us. We've lost a lot of our federal support. We've lost our checkpoints. We've lost our aerostat. We've lost our one of our border patrol stations is no longer supporting our mission here and helping us because they've been shut down and they've been reassigned for child care, processing, and things like that. So the resources we had a year ago, six months ago, are no longer here with us. So where are they? They're in other parts of the country on the border. Allison, he says he says his team has stepped up to try to make up for some of those lost resources. They've done things like uh, installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. But he says that at the end of the day, they are not immigration officials. They cannot enforce immigration policy and they need those federal partners on the ground, Allison. Dash, I know you've been talking to ranchers in the area. What are they saying about all the people crossing the border uh, where they live? Yeah, important to remember, there are people who live right there, right on the border. Most of them ranchers, yeah. many who have been there for generations. They've seen this uh, time and time again. We spoke to one rancher, Jim Chilton, uh, who tells us that he is incredibly frustrated right now. He actually watched as uh, border construction on his property stopped uh, the very day that Joe Biden signed uh, that executive order. And I want you to take a listen to, to his perspective on this. It leaves us with people trespassing across our ranch. It leaves us in danger. And the real truth is that I'm armed at all times. And if I run into a drug group, I go the other way. I have guns on my saddle, holster with gun. Jim Chilton, of course, was a supporter of the wall, but he's also frustrated now seeing uh, those federal resources leaving his community just as these numbers are growing here, Allison. All right. Dasha Burns in Arizona. Thank you, my friend. Unsanitary conditions at Johnson & Johnson's Baltimore plant, according to the FDA, a CDC meeting to address the vaccine's pause tomorrow. It has been a rough week for J&J here in the U.S., but the European Union is now rolling out that shot again. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almagar has more. Allison, this nation is capable of vaccinating about 3 million Americans a day, and that comes as we learn more about the possible future of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in this country. Despite a warning about the risk of blood clots, safety regulators in the European Union recommend resuming the Johnson & Johnson vaccine rollout overseas, saying the benefits outweigh the risk. EU regulators took into consideration of the nearly 8 million Americans given the single-dose shot, only six women developed serious blood clotting, leading to one fatality. In these cases that we have seen here is occurring very, very rarely. The cleared hurdle for Johnson & Johnson comes after authorities in Europe could not identify any clear risk factors like sex or age. Wasting no time, J&J &J says it will resume its European rollout. With respect to our specific vaccine, uh, we do have strong conviction in the benefit risk profile. The decision comes ahead of Friday's CDC advisory meeting. But even if Johnson & Johnson is given the green light to resume in the United States, for some, the damage may already be done. People that I've talked to have mentioned um, just not trusting, not believing, wanting to wait and see. Concern over vaccine hesitancy comes as nine states now report a climb in COVID cases by at least 25 percent. Even though Connecticut recently hit its highest hospitalizations in months, the governor is set to soon lift nearly every restriction, including capacity limits for businesses. To say we were happy to hear it, it was an understatement, obviously. This morning, our nation anxious to move forward, while the future of Johnson & Johnson's vaccine will soon be decided here at home.
This morning, according to some studies, many Americans, upwards of one in five, remain hesitant about getting vaccinated. This is hundreds of thousands of vaccination appointments remain open today. Now to NBC's week-long cross-platform series, The Climate Challenge. More electric vehicles hitting the roads, major automakers putting more resources into the electric car game. But engineers are still struggling with a big problem, battery power. Right now, they only last about 300 miles. But Ample, a California tech company, has an answer for that. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward is inside Ample's San Francisco facility with an exclusive look at their solution. Jake, I am so into this. Tell us about Ample and show us what they're doing. So, Allison, it's been a very interesting day watching Uber drivers, who were the first to sort of test out this system coming and going. Now, when we think about the millions of electric vehicles we want to see on the roads to, to fight climate emissions, the question is, how do you get them all charged? You would need acres of parking lots. Well, this system solves that problem. Underneath this Nissan Leaf, you can see a robot that comes in, grabs batteries from underneath, pulls them out and replaces them in about the time it would take you to fill up a gas car. Now, have a listen to what the CEO of this company had to say about the, the potential here and the real world implementation of it. We are at a point right now where we have proven this works. We, it's, it's in the real world, it's deployed. Uh, Uber drivers are the first ones to get their hands on this, but they're driving it like they drive a gas car, and it's working for them, and it's actually cheaper uh, than driving a gas car. Now, it's not just the robot you see doing the work underneath the car. It's also the fact that once the robot pulls that battery out, Allison, it goes into the system back here and gets plugged into a long bank of battery charging stations here. All you need to do this whole thing is a 220 volt connection, the kind of thing that would run your hot tub at home. And it allows these batteries yeah. to be charged off something like solar power at the right time. So just a fascinating implementation for getting what we all, in theory, want to have happen into a real business model house. All right, so let's talk about how it's actually working in practice. I know Uber is Ample's biggest client and drivers in San Francisco are testing out the system. What are they saying about it, Jake? Yeah, so when we spoke with the head of sustainability policy for Uber today, you know, that company has committed to having 100% emissions-free transportation by 2030 in the U.S., Canada, uh, and Europe, I believe. So uh, we asked them, you know, well, what, what is the purpose of doing so? Why does Uber want to do this? This is what he had to say. One of the primary uh, cost barriers that commercial drivers, part-time and full-time experience, rideshare included, is the opportunity cost of charging, meaning all the time it takes to search for charging, access charging, and actually plug in the vehicle is time away from earnings. All fleets experience this. If you're able to swap a battery, get the vehicle full of mileage again in just a couple of minutes, you've really cracked that problem and turned it on, on its ear. You know, really, Allison, if you think about it, right, up until now, electric vehicles have been a money loser. They're more expensive for us to buy, they take more time to charge, and government subsidies have been really making these a possibility. But in this case, we're looking at something that could be 10 to 20 percent cheaper than filling your gas car, Allison. Very cool stuff. Jake Ward, you always show us the neatest things happening in technology. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Two tech titans on Capitol Hill today, a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee looking into antitrust issues with Apple and Google's app stores. Let's bring in NBC News senior media reporter Dylan Byers. Uh, so, Dylan, what's the biggest issue here? Well, look, the, the fundamental question here is, do Apple and Google, who basically own the app marketplace, right? If you want to access an app, you, ha you get it right. through your iPhone, through Apple, through Android, uh, uh, through Google. Do they have an unfair competitive advantage and are they abusing their power because not only do they own the marketplace, but they also create various apps uh, that we use? And are they putting those competitors at a disadvantage? Now, what Apple and Google will argue here is, look, we have created immense opportunity uh, for more competition among app developers and we have made the experience for consumers 
much better by creating the, these technologies. What their critics would say is, yes, that's all well and good, but you control the marketplace, you set the prices, and if an app comes along that competes with an app that you create, well, then that app is effectively screwed and can get run out of business. So three tech companies that rely on these app stores came in and served as witnesses today. Uh, tell us who they were uh, and a little bit more about their, their particular situation. Sure. So, so the, the big two are Spotify and Match Group. And, and both Spotify and Match Group are big companies that have been waging the war against Apple chiefly, but Apple and Google for mm -hmm. quite some time. The third is Tile. And what's notable about Tile's inclusion here Tile makes something that effectively helps you put a digital keychain yeah. on a device so that you can find something using your iPhone that you might have left around the house or left somewhere. Apple just yesterday rolled out uh, its own competitor to this. So that sort of highlights to you uh, in very real terms the dilemma here. Here you have a company that is effectively saying, how are we going to compete with Apple when Apple is providing its own service using technology it won't even allow us to use, uh, uh, what, what is our business future going forward? And so I think that's really become a sort of poster child for the lawmakers mm -hmm. who are trying to argue that Apple and Google are abusing their power. Yeah, it, it feels like with the AirTags, Apple handed them a case in point uh, today or yesterday, rather. Did Tile really ha hammer that home? I mean, was that the thing that we're really going to use to say, I mean, look, this just happened yesterday. Yeah, absolutely, Allison. And, and effectively, I, I think one of the most interesting arguments that the representative for Tile made was that Apple did not give them access to certain technologies that made the mm. system more, that, that would have made Tile a more uh, uh, useful service. And then when they rolled out, when Apple rolled out its own version of Tile, they use those very same technologies. And so I think that's something, Senator Amy Klobuchar, Senator Mike Lee, I think that's something they're going to fasten on as they pursue this antitrust mm -hmm. uh, case going forward. Oh, it is such a fascinating case, Dylan. I'm so into the ins and outs of it. Thank you for coming on to talk us through today. Thank you. From iconic department stores to major restaurant chains, the coronavirus devastating the U.S. economy. But for every big name company that's filed for bankruptcy during the pandemic, there are small business owners who are suffering as well. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule has more in today's Bottom Line. The pandemic wreaked havoc on major retailers. We're now expecting a significant number of bankruptcies potentially filed between now and June or July. Since March of last year, a slew of big name brands have filed for bankruptcy. Brooks Brothers has filed for bankruptcy protection. Neiman Marcus, JCPenney, J. Crew, GNC, and others as well. Mall staples and customer favorites like Lord & Taylor, Pier 1 Imports, and Lucky Brands. The pandemic has dramatically reduced foot traffic, and to the extent that you rely on brick and mortar sales, that's a recipe for a very difficult time. Last year, 628 large companies filed for bankruptcy, the most since 2011. And just last month, 61 filed, nearly double the number from February. One of them is Paper Source, the stationery and gift store. It filed for bankruptcy with over $100 million in debt. Some of that money owed to small business owners like Lisa Mohar. And what was your relationship like until March of this year? When I first got an email, um, a purchase order with them, I was super thrilled. It was like a big goal of mine um, to be in there. So I, I was thrilled. For two years, the Brooklyn-based illustrator supplied Paper Source with cards and gifts to sell in its 158 locations across the country. While 2020 was challenging, as it was for many people, this year started looking much better. In 2021, they ordered a lot from me. Um, I was very excited because it seemed like it was like turning over a new leaf. And I didn't really want to question it because I thought it was just a sign of good things coming. And then when we heard that they filed for bankruptcy, it was like they just pulled the rug out from under us. She fulfilled the large order from Paper Source in late February. But now that it's in bankruptcy, she says the company hasn't paid her in full, even as stores remain open. I shipped my product. They were supposed to pay me. They're not going to pay me, but they're going to be allowed to keep their doors open and sell my card in over 150 stores. It, it feels like they're selling stolen goods. I don't understand how this is legal. 
Alex Gagne also thought a large order was a sign of paper sources recovery, not impending bankruptcy. We thought it was something exciting and cool that turned out to be the complete opposite. <laughs> Her company, Chez Gagne, which sells cheeky cards, gifts, and paper goods, has been working with Paper Source for over five years. They placed like an $8,000 order in January, and then to place a $11,000 order in February, again, is very unusual. We would see those numbers maybe in a six-month period, not in a two-month period. Several suppliers, like Alex and Lisa, question why Paper Source placed these large orders, then filed for bankruptcy, leaving them out thousands of dollars. Winnie Park, the CEO of Paper Source, told NBC News these purchases were consistent with how Paper Source has always operated, where the retailer buys more at the start of the year to plan for upcoming holidays like Mother's Day. As these largely women-owned vendors try to get Paper Source to pay them the thousands of dollars they're owed, executives at the bankrupt company are requesting a combined total of a million dollars in potential bonuses for themselves. There is something uncomfortable in seeing executives being paid large sums while many of the suppliers are going um, unpaid. Many of those suppliers operate on slim margins. A few thousand bucks can make or break them. And with a national chain like Paper Source now in bankruptcy, it's possible they may only get a portion of what they're owed. Bankruptcy doesn't have a social agenda. It doesn't have a public policy agenda in the sense that it's trying to um, distribute the pain in a way that is consistent with maybe some notions of fairness. Paper Source says it started to pay back some of the vendors, at least partially, and hopes to pay everyone eventually in full. But if we're not getting paid for what we've already supplied, who knows if we're even going to make it to that point? They've made it through the pandemic, but still struggle with the ripple effects. If you're not getting enough sleep, could you end up with dementia? According to a new study from Nature Communications, older adults who sleep six hours or less increase their risk of dementia by 30 percent. So what does that mean for all of us who aren't getting enough shut eye? NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson takes a look. Here's something else to keep you up at night. If you don't get enough sleep in your 50s and 60s, you could be more likely to develop dementia later in life. That nightmarish news from a study in Nature Communications. It followed 8,000 people in Britain for 25 years, starting at age 50. Those who slept six hours or less a night increased their risk for dementia by 30 percent, compared to those who got seven hours or more of shut-eye. It is a critical health behavior that you must take into consideration as you are aging. Dr. Assisi Satius, a sleep expert at NYU Langone Health, says sleep helps clear the brain of clumps of protein fragments called plaques associated with Alzheimer's. So does this mean if I sleep six hours or less, I'm going to get dementia? It doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is that it increases your risk significantly. And so people should take this finding as a public awareness warning. Author Terry Brennan has dealt with sleep apnea for decades. Both his parents suffered from dementia. If there's anything I can do to make sure that I'm not going to get dementia, I'm going to work at that. To make sure you get those crucial seven hours or more, Dr. Satia says you should treat sleep as an investment. Relax before you go to bed, avoid heavy meals and alcohol before bedtime, and turn off your devices to turn off your mind and rest. Prescription drug prices vary across the country, but I bet you can guess where they're the most expensive. That's right, New York City. Prices there 24% above the national average. That's according to online healthcare platform GoodRx. Denver, the least expensive at 36.5% below the national average. Wherever you live, a new online pharmacy is designed to help you find the lowest drug prices. NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn shows us how it works. Hey, Allison, we are all looking for ways to save money. I'm about to show you how a new site could help certain consumers cut costs on routine generic medicines. The company behind it says its average customer saves about $1,000 a year. You can see right away for free whether it will work for you. For millions of Americans who use prescription drugs, there's a new game in town. The hardest thing in healthcare is no one pays the same price for the same thing. You could have 10 people walk into a pharmacy 
and get the exact same medication and pay 10 different prices. Zach Zeller and Mark McCormick are hoping to change that. They're the co-founders of Scripco, a new membership-based online pharmacy that sells generic medicine to consumers at wholesale cost. So if you pay 10 cents for a pill, I pay 10 cents for a pill? Exactly. That's exactly correct. How do you make your money? So our money and our revenue come solely from the membership. It costs $140 a year or $50 for three months. Before joining, you can see exactly how much you might save. Enter your prescriptions on the Scripco website and see the wholesale cost of your meds. It's free to check and the site won't ask for any personal information unless you join. For example, a 30-day supply of the antidepressant Duloxetine, a generic of Cymbalta, costs as low as $1.50 with the Scripco membership. But take a look at the range prices for that same drug at different pharmacies. When we check GoodRx, a company that tracks drug prices, it went from $6 to $59. The generic for cholesterol drug Lipitor, a Torvastatin, costs $2.10 at Scripco. The price ranged from $4 to $49 on GoodRx using a savings club or coupon. I was shocked that a prescription could be that low. Stacy Augustin says she's saving around $400 a year on the eight generics she takes to treat high blood pressure, cholesterol, and other ailments. And working, you know, two jobs, it's very important uh, to save all I can. But the plan doesn't work for all medicines. Scripco only sells generic meds, no brand-only drugs, and no controlled substances. So it's important to talk to a pharmacist who knows all the medicines you're taking to avoid any negative drug interruptions. Zeller says Scripco works best for the 79 million Americans on three or more maintenance medications. He introduced us to Victor Soto, who regularly takes eight generics. Ballpark annual savings was over $1,200. And have you noticed any change in your medications or how your body's reacting to these pills? Everything is perfect. Unlike most other pharmacies, Scripco doesn't accept insurance. The company says that allows it to cut out the middlemen known as pharmacy benefit managers and set its own prices. Zeller says some members are stunned when they save more and not using insurance, including his own wife, Amy. My migraines are always above my right eye. She says she used to ration her migraine pills because they cost $44 each. Do you think people would be shocked to learn it was $44 a pill even with insurance? Uh, yeah, because I was. <laughs> I dove into our wholesale database and saw that the exact same pill was $2.99 from the same manufacturer. It's time for a change. And keep in mind, these are the early days for this business model. Scripco is in about 39 states so far. It has 1,400 members. We put a lot more for you on today.com. Hey, NBC News viewers. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here. And click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.